In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. While he was still speaking, a man from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Don't fear, only believe, and she shall be well. And he went to the house, and he took her by the hand, and said, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them not to tell anyone what had happened. Now that is a reading from today's Gospel, when Jesus went and raised a child from the dead. Jesus healed so many people that he came into contact with. Jesus' life was a healing ministry. Today, though, I want to reflect on a particular healing that Jesus did from a distance. And we read about this in Luke chapter 7. Jesus entered the city of Capernaum. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him elders to the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I too am a man set under authority. I have soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found that the servant was well. Jesus healed the servant, not having even entered the house. The centurion's world is a world that's governed by a chain of command. And because he is living in that kind of world, that is the way that he understands faith. Just as a captain has authority over a private and a general has authority over a captain, so too Jesus has authority over all things, seen and unseen. During liturgy, we call Jesus King and Lord and God. We refer to our Lord with titles that recognize not only who he is, but who he is in our lives. So when we use these titles to describe Jesus, we're not just saying, you are these titles. We're also saying, I believe that you are that for me. You are my king. You are my Lord. You are my God. We have to recognize who we are in relation to him and vice versa. When we confess him with these titles, we are simultaneously confessing ourselves to be subjects and disciples of Jesus, who we are saying is our ruler. He is our ruler. In scripture, Jesus taught, call no man father, for you have one father who is in heaven. The apostolic church understands that Jesus spoke in times, in hyperbolic ways, in order to stress a point that he was trying to make. So when we read scripture, we try to understand the literary genre. We don't have a literal interpretation, interpretation of scripture in the Armenian church. We have a literary interpretation of scripture. That is to say, we try to understand the literary genre and to read Jesus' words accordingly. For instance, Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Or if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. We understand these to be hyperbolic phrases. Jesus was trying to stress a point. He wasn't saying to chop off your limbs or gouge out your eyes. Similarly, Jesus saying, call no man father, is a hyperbolic phrase. We have to, after all, call our earthly fathers something. And even one of the Ten Commandments says to honor your father and mother. I say this to illustrate that Jesus wants us to be perpetually mindful when we are using titles to remember the place of God in our lives. So when we call someone, for instance, on earth, boss, we are to be thinking, well, yes, that person serves as my boss on the earth, but my true boss is God. We always have to be mindful of that. 
And this brings us to the title, particularly this Veterans Day weekend, of Commander in Chief. When this per term is used, people usually think of the person serving in the office of the presidency and for the purpose of the United States government, the president is the Commander in Chief. However, as Christians, when we use this phrase, we must be mindful that our true Commander in Chief is Christ. He is our ruler. It is from him that we take our marching orders. He is our sovereign. And we are all soldiers in the army of the Lord. Jesus is our ultimate commander in chief. So whenever we hear that term, Christ should come into our minds. And we are to think of ourselves as Christian soldiers. You all know that. Onward, Christian soldiers. St. Paul teaches us that we are soldiers in his second letter to Timothy. From 2 Timothy chapter 2, share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. And we have all been enlisted into the army of God by virtue of our baptism, by virtue of our faith, by virtue of receiving Holy Communion we are enlisted. Through baptism and through our confession of Christ as Lord and Savior, we have effectively taken an oath to live as soldiers, to live as disciples, which means that we have an obligation to preserve, protect, and defend the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, his teachings. Soldiers understand the nature of military command. The centurion in the gospel accepted that Jesus had the authority to heal. He took as a matter of fact that Jesus, simply by issuing the order, could heal the centurion's servant. Being a Christian means having this kind of matter of fact faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is impressed by this level of faith. In the scripture, he says to the centurion, not even in Israel have I found such faith. It is done for you. Your servant is healed, just as you believed. Since this is Veterans Day weekend, we're reflecting on soldiers, and we should pray for those that are currently in harm's way. We pray as well for veterans and for all those who are suffering the effects of war, not only the soldiers themselves, but their family as well. It's also a time for us to reflect on biblical battles. In the Old Testament, we read of occasions when Israel plundered cities and burnt them to the ground, when enemy soldiers ran for their lives, the Israelites tracked them down and slaughtered them. They killed every man, woman, and child they could find. The Bible says they did not leave any that breathed. Now, how do we reconcile this? Because on the one hand, we believe in a loving, forgiving, and merciful God. On the other hand, we have passages in the Old Testament where God says to Israel, and to the Israeli army to destroy another army utterly, to destroy the town and the people utterly, completely, total destruction. So in seminary, I asked the theology professor, how can we square our belief in a loving God with this Old Testament history of God ordering the slaughter of those who opposed him? And the answer I received was twofold both from the seminary professor and also from Chashak Sarbazan, who gave me some uh, important insight into this. First, God does not see death as we do. Even in today's gospel reading, when the people said, this child has died, and the scripture affirms that the child is dead, Jesus looks at her and said, she's sleeping. Why? Because he's looking as God, and he knows that as God, he can waken anyone from death. He can waken them like that, and we believe he will do that. God knows that he has that authority and power. And second, at some point in history, God had to demonstrate to the world that he truly was sovereign over the nations. And in order to do this, there needed to be a time in history where God showed that he has ultimate power, and that when he goes to war, or when he sends his army to war, and they follow his orders, they will inevitably have victory because he is the all-powerful one. And as we remember this and how it has happened historically in the Old Testament, 
we also remember that that's precisely what God's going to do in the second coming. Another utter, ultimate destruction of evil. The first at his resurrection, and the second at his second coming. When God destroyed in the Old Testament, he did so in two ways. One was utter and complete desolation and destruction, and the other was almost complete destruction, but with a preservation of some people. And those people were known as the remnant, and the reason in the Bible they're called the remnant is they were, it's like a piece of fabric. If you tear off a little piece of fabric, you have a remnant from a larger cloth. That remnant was to testify to the power of God's destruction, what God had actually accomplished. So God would leave a remnant so they could testify to what happened to those who opposed the God of Israel. God made it clear to Israel and to the nations that he was the source of their victory. They were not victorious because Israel's soldiers were expert military men, but because God was fighting for them in the midst of those battles. He was intervening and giving them success. So Israel was ordered to wage war at times. But when Israel was ordered to wage war, they were ordered to wage war with very specific restrictions and commands. And they had to follow them to the letter. And if they did not follow them to the letter, there would be bad consequences for Israel. For instance, if God said to destroy, but don't take any plunder, and they took plunder, then things would become bad for the Israelites. When the battle was over, in the book of Joshua, and you all know the story of how Joshua and the Israelites fought the battle of Jericho, um, we see a clue of how God operates in what he told the nation of Israel to do in regard to the chariots, the chariots. When the battle was over, God told the Israelites to burn the chariots that they had captured from the enemy. Now, why would God do that? Why would God say burn the chariots? The chariots were effectively like the Sherman tank of today. It was the greatest military weapon that people had. Why would you burn the chariots? Because God was saying, you're not going to win because of chariots. You're going to win because of me. So burn the chariots. And if they kept the chariots, they would suffer. If they broke God's words, they would suffer. To the Israelites of Joshua's day, War was fought under God, and God was the nation's security, not the latest weapon. The minute they trusted in themselves for their defense, they lost wars, or even if they initially won the war, great suffering would come upon the nation. Most Americans find this approach to warfare unimaginable, but ancient Israel rejected the secular wisdom of peace through strength. Their peace was to be found in fully following the word of God. So they acted faithfully, and when they did so, which was many times, they avoided destruction. And they usually had great victories, but not always. When they disobeyed, they suffered. When Israel decided not to obey, they suffered, and we read about this in Hosea, where the prophet says, speaking the words of God, because you have trusted in your chariots, and in the multitude of your warriors. Therefore the tumult of war shall rise amongst your people, and all your fortresses will be destroyed. The message of the Old Testament is clear. If you want peace, fully follow the word of God. If you want blessings, fully follow the word of God. Don't pick and choose. Complete submission to our Lord. Anything less than that will result in suffering. Today, when we as Christians think about pursuing peace and how we can be modern warriors for peace, we recall the words of God said at each Babadak, prayed by the priest on behalf of the church. And the prayer says that Jesus came to make this world into heaven. These are the words. It is truly proper and right with most earnest diligence always to glorify and adore you, Father Almighty, who, having taken the church to be a people unto himself, made his own those who believe in you. He was pleased to dwell amongst us in a ponderable nature, according to the dispensation through the Virgin, and as the divine master builder building a new work, 
he thereby made this earth into heaven. Where is heaven? Heaven is where God is. When we are with God, we are in heaven. So in the church, as we celebrate the presence of Christ, in Vadarak, in Holy Communion, and in one another, we have this experience of heaven. It's a foreshadowing, a foretaste, if you will. But it's very real, because God is very present. So then the peace we seek as Christians is found in warfare, in spiritual warfare, of us fighting against sin, of us fighting against false teachings. What we must do is have loving, prayerful submission to the Word of God. Rather than seeking the destruction of our enemies, Jesus has taught us to act differently. He said, love your enemies, forgive your enemies, serve your enemies. And when we do these holy actions, trusting God, it is then that he brings peace to our hearts, and in due time, he will bring peace to the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today, as we remember Veterans Day, let us not only thank God who have laid down their lives to save others, let us all thank God for the saintly people who have fought and are still engaged in spiritual warfare. Let us pray for one another and live as soldiers of Christ, loving, forgiving, and serving our enemies. In the words of Jesus, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon head. In the words of our Lord and King, in the words of our one true eternal commander in chief, and I'll close with this from Luke chapter 6. If you love those, Jesus says, who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But I tell you, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. So be merciful, just as your Heavenly Father is merciful.